honestly, it seems like these white people are buying affection from their black friends and from black influencers. And that has nothing to do with the movement. You cannot buy your way out of white guilt. You cannot buy forgiveness for racism. I don't want to receive $20 from a random white person. Hi guys, welcome to my channel. Today I want to talk about reparations. I want to talk about reparations because I think since Black Lives Matter has kind of had this surge of support, um, reparations has been discussed more and more. And I think that there is some disagreement in the public about what the meaning of reparations is. I think that on one hand we have this kind of more traditional 40 acres and a mule concept um, where, I mean, we're kind of past the point of literally 40 acres and a mule, um, but where the government would pay an amount to black people. Um, and I would describe that as institutionalized reparations. And then there's another camp of people who perceive reparations as, or who want reparations to be a transaction that takes place between individuals. I would describe this as direct reparations. I realized I jumped right into this without introducing myself. So, hi, my name is Alex. I'm from Minneapolis. I like politics and pop culture. I hope you do as well because that's what my channel is about. This particular video is about reparations. Okay, back to the video. So there are some people who feel that, you know, the government is too slow to deal with reparations. I would agree. And their solution is that individual white citizens should pay money to individual black people. Um, and I have some problems with that idea. I think that it creates transactional relationships between black people and white people. I think that it opens the door for profiteering in the Black Lives Matter movement. And most importantly, I think that it does not account for the fact that it results in different black people receiving different amounts of reparations, which to me goes against the point of what reparations is, everyone receiving an equal payment. So I'm gonna go over the history of reparations in the United States. I'm gonna try to get through the history fast. It's a little boring, interesting to my nerd brain, um, but maybe not as interesting to everyone else. And then I'm gonna talk about um, how reparations has kind of um, very quickly been, I think kind of hijacked by this vocal minority of people in lefty circles, from largely liberal arts colleges. I used to go to liberal arts college. Um, and that I think is in many ways very, very different from what reparations originally was. Reparations in the United States, um, after you know the 40 acres and a mule concept was discussed after the abolition of slavery, the first time that I could really see it being introduced in a legislative context is this bill called the Commission to Study Reparations Proposals for African Americans Act. And that was a bill proposed by Representative John Conyers Jr., a Democrat from Michigan. Um, he proposed the bill unsuccessfully to the US Congress annually from 1989 until his retirement in 2017. Sometimes his retirement is described as a resignation because um, when he was 88, he retired and was also um, fielding several sexual harassment allegations from staffers. Um, so he continuously denied those allegations, uh, but he also resigned in the wake of those allegations. I think that's an interesting tidbit. Um, he was also the senior member of the House Judiciary Committee. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote an article called The Case for Reparations. I knew this was wrong as soon as I said it. It's Ta-Nehisi. For The Atlantic in 2014, that was pretty popular. Um, reparations was brought up to, um, in, in my memory, to Bernie Sanders several times in 2016. I feel in a disingenuous way to try and trip him up with black voters. Um, that was interesting. A lot of African Americans are starting to call for reparations. Is that something that you would support as president? No, I don't think so. I think it would be, you know, very divisive. I'm so sorry for including this curse Bernie Sanders clip that I think about all the time. Okay, back to the video. And then in 2020, reparations was raised again to the uh, Democratic presidential candidates and several of them endorsed reparations um, in, in varying capacities. I would say Marianne Williamson gave the most full-throated endorsement of reparations and uh, Beto O'Rourke gave the weakest one. We're struggling with the names. It's Beto, Beto O'Rourke. So uh, those candidates who uh, showed support for reparations are Andrew Yang, Marianne Williamson, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, Tulsi Gabbard, Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, 
Beto O'Rourke and Tom Steyer to the full list. Um, I thought Marianne Williamson's statement was great. Um, Tulsi is a co-sponsor of the reparations bill in the House and Bernie is a co-sponsor in the Senate. Um, so shout out to Tulsi and Bernie and to Marianne Williamson. Um, recently, the BET founder, Robert Johnson, called for $14 trillion in reparations for African-Americans, which I find numerically accurate, but somewhat, um, maybe somewhat unrealistic. Maybe I should dream bigger. I don't know. Um, I did a little research on the amount that is owed to African-Americans. Market Watch estimates $51 trillion. Um, Yahoo Finance estimates $17 trillion. So that's where that, that um, $17 trillion figure is coming from. So that is the history of traditional institutionalized reparations in the United States, as I would describe it. Institutionalized reparations from the government to African-American people in equal amounts to every African-American person. And I think it's important to remember that reparations is a debt that can never be repaid. You can't repay the atrocities that took place. You can't repay the fact that black people built this country and now largely do not benefit from the country's economic prowess. That cannot be undone. And I think the purpose of reparations is not to undo all oppression. The direct reparations people tend to believe that, oh, white people should pay reparations to black people an infinite number of times forever in an unspecified amount. I find that unrealistic. Reparations is not about repaying black people forever. To me, it's about, it's supposed to be a little bit of a consolation prize. Slavery cannot be paid back. I do not think we should try to pay back slavery. That is impossible. So the concept of direct reparations is different from institutionalized reparations, from the uh, more traditional conception of reparations that I am personally more familiar with. I am a proponent of institutionalized reparations. I think the US government should pay black people what we are owed. Um, I think that the US government should take responsibility. I think that the benefits are both in the government taking responsibility and in black people receiving money. Um, and I think there's kind of some other dynamics um, going on with direct reparations that maybe don't have to do with taking responsibility and paying back a debt um, and that have more to do with certain social dynamics and feelings of guilt from white allies and the ways that they choose to ameliorate that guilt. Um, so there's a USA Today article about direct reparations um, in practice because this idea has made it all the way into the mainstream news now. Why are some white people randomly gifting black people money? I don't know, USA Today article. This guy was paid direct reparations by a white stranger, completely unsolicitedly. It's almost as if this white person was looking for a quick and easy way to unload their guilt without even asking the other person what their needs are in the situation. This is so odd to me because I feel like giving someone cash is the most detached and emotionally unavailable way that you can approach dealing with someone's distress. Like, obviously it's not comparable to interpersonal stuff or romantic stuff, but if I'm going through a breakup, would you give me money to indicate that you care about engaging with my feelings? This is the opposite of organizing to me. It's disorganized financial anarchy. I've had white people offer me money when I do not want money. Um, I'm a pretty politically outspoken person. I don't want to be paid a tip for being outspoken. That is weird to me. Um, I would much rather that white people engage genuinely in racial conversations rather than try to pay their way out of having to think about race. Um, I just don't appreciate that. And so um, I saw a TikTok because I think it's uh, kind of a millennial and Gen Z thing, this direct reparations concept, maybe kind of just Gen Z actually. Um, I'm kind of millennial Gen Z cusp but I saw a TikTok that exemplified this concept. Hi, if you've just learned a thing or two about racism and inequality in American society, and you're tempted to text a paragraph to your black friend, acquaintance, or coworker from a year ago, stop, there's a better way. We have a new system called giving your black friend 10 to $20. Our research has shown that four out of five of your black friends would much rather receive an instant payment of 10 to $20 than have to validate your feelings about learning about what they've been dealing with their entire lives. Jesus Christ, God forbid white people should ever learn anything from black people. So as you can see, um, direct reparations 
Many proponents of direct reparations present a very simplistic and I feel reductive solution to interpersonal racism, which is don't think, don't really uh, search for other ways to take responsibility for your actions if you're a white ally, just fork over the cash. It feels like being tipped. It's very condescending. Um, it makes me feel like an employee of my white friends instead of a peer. There's no real discussion of like, when does reparations stop? When, because it seems like direct reparations proponents um, conceive of it as connected, not necessarily to slavery, um, but to the emotional labor of explaining racism or discussing racism. And there's always going to be some emotional labor involved in having a white friend who doesn't understand race and you're talking about it and yada, yada, yada. Does that mean that your white friends are eternally indebted to you and that they should always be paying you? Because, I mean, I don't know, I kind of would want some like, you know, beginning and end to reparations. Like the discussion is opened, it happens, reparations happens, and then there's closure. Um, but I don't know, it seems like these people don't want closure. It assumes that I want money more than I want engagement or discussion. Um, you know, I found that a lot of my white friends are somewhat unwilling to engage in racial discussions because they're so fearful of being perceived as racist. Um, they're not willing to use their critical thinking skills. And I think that leads to essentially getting scammed in this way by someone who wants to profit off of black death. I will add, I know there are people who use reparations for mutual aid purposes who are in need, and I'm not trying to come after people's GoFundMes. Do your GoFundMe, that's great, that's awesome. I want people to get their need met. But what I have a problem with is, I think there are people who don't wanna do a GoFundMe because they feel like they're putting their suffering out there, which I understand is uncomfortable um, and can be traumatic. But there's a difference between help me meet my need during this time when the black community is hurting, which I think is fine, and you owe me because another black person died. I'm not really sure what I think about these hybrid mutual aid slash reparations requests that say, I have need and you owe me because I'm black. But ultimately, I think that mutual aid is a better framework for dealing with need. Mutual aid is transparent. It lets people know exactly what your level of need is, whereas reparations is opaque. It leaves people guessing about what your level of need is and oftentimes leads them to make their decisions based on other factors, like how much they like you. I just wanted to add that because attacking poor people is bad. That being said, because I respect poor people, I'm going to hold them to the same standard of interpersonal conduct as everybody else. What does paying your black friend 10 to $20 have to do with George Floyd or Breonna Taylor? Like, how is that related? How does that serve them? I just really don't understand. It creates a popularity contest. So I don't really understand how these people feel like if we're doing direct reparations, they don't seem like they have any aspirations about how to distribute those reparations equitably. They seem fine with the fact that black people who are popular or who are influencers are gonna be getting much more money than black people who are just living their day-to-day -day lives. And I think it assumes that all black people agree on this method. To assume that other black people want to receive random condescending payments from white people who they might not even know and want to establish a transactional relationship with their white peers, that's a big assumption. I don't want white people tipping me for being friends with them or for explaining things to them. It's just odd and to me it defeats the purpose of having a genuine conversation. The next example I saw of reparations um, to me is like the, of direct reparations, to me is like a, a better example or like maybe like the best possible way that direct reparations can go. Um, I saw a discussion between <laughs> Tucker Carlson and Cameron Witten. Well, a bar in Portland, Oregon offered a reparations happy hour earlier this week in which white people were not invited to attend, but were invited to pay for. So reparations happy hour is a uh, event that was a successful event that was put on by nonprofit Brown Hope. And what we did was that 40 black, brown, and indigenous people attended this event. We had over 150 white people donate. That's $1,500 of guilt money for happy hour drinks. Not that marginalized people don't deserve drinks, but it went to drinks. 
It's a little patronizing, no, though? And it makes the white people feel virtuous, like they're coming to the rescue. And, it, and I don't know how it makes the black people feel, but it probably makes some of them feel patronized, I would think. Thank you, Tucker. So I saw your show, I saw your segment about uh, racism, Roseanne Barr. We're both uh -huh. going to agree that racism is real. This debate is like two ships passing in the night. Cameron Witten repeatedly states that racism is real. He seems like maybe he expected Tucker Carlson to dispute the existence of racism. And rather than dispute the existence of racism, Tucker Carlson simply asks, does this method work? Does this method really serve to ameliorate racism? Um, so, and I guess that's kind of the point that I am making is that not all black mm -hmm. people are the same, not all white people are the same. You have different attitudes, yeah. different income levels. And this kind of suggests they are because you're saying if you're a certain color, you're in one category. If you're in an another color, you're in another category. Well, we're saying that racism is real. Nobody has contested that during this debate. And that racial disparities exist. And so we're offering a solution saying that we are calling on folks from a privileged demographic to pay into a solution and invest in the leadership of black, brown, and indigenous people. By paying we for don't care about exceptions, <laughs> we care about the facts. Does it make you uncomfortable to generalize on the basis mm -hmm. of race in the way that mm -hmm. you are, despite the fact you're making money from it, which again, as a capitalist, I applaud. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing scam, but does it make you uncomfortable <laughs> at all? Scam. According to Cameron Witten, the idea that this is a scam is laughable but I don't hear any articulation of why it's not a scam. It is. The, the, We're the being part resourceful. That I love. Maybe the argument is that Black Lives Matter activists are so morally righteous that they're entitled to operate a scam. We're and, working and, with our partners <laughs> to invest in this, this work. We were successful. Uh -huh. We were successful. Send Brando me a guilt offering. Elevating. Pay for my drinks. <laughs> We raised a great issue. We called it happy hours. And but you, you made know money. What? This event was about. You made money. We did. It. That's right. We, we elevated reparations. I will send $10 of reparations to anybody who can tell me what that means. Uh -huh. We elevated reparations. Good job. Because Good job. Are, are All you right. a, we're, unfortunately, Tucker, we're out are of you time. I, I'd love to. You're a capitalist. I know that. I thought I was a capitalist until I met you. Cutting him off like that is a bit of a cheap shot, but it's not like he didn't know how the show works. And he had a really long time to provide at least one counter argument to the notion that this is a scam. He doesn't justify his methods. I have no idea why Cameron Witten thinks that this method is preferable to other methods of anti-racist organizing. You know, I hate to say it, but I think that Tucker Carlson has some points here. Um, I think he was pretty rude to Cameron Witten in the debate. Um, I feel like he was interrupting him a lot, but I also think that Cameron Witten was somewhat non-responsive to a lot of the reasonable reservations that people might have about the idea of direct reparations. Tucker Carlson brought up pretty promptly that it is patronizing to establish this kind of transactional relationship between black people and white people. Um, and that point kind of goes uncontested throughout the discussion. Tucker Carlson uh, brought up that it reinforces an element of social segregation, um, that it's people literally treating each other quite differently on the basis of skin color. I think that, or I, I would call it race, but he said skin color. Tucker Carlson points out that it doesn't necessarily address slavery directly. Reparations in this case would be going to people who are black people who are not descended from slaves and to indigenous people. Um, and I also find that to be kind of beside the point. And then lastly, Tucker Carlson said that it was very capitalistic. Um, and I think when Cameron Witten brought up, oh, this uplifts black leadership of this organization, he's promoting his own organization. He is the leader um, and he's right. It does promote his leadership as an individual um, to have this kind of transaction take place. And it's not bad to promote yourself. You know, we all promote ourselves in our careers. I'm making a YouTube video promoting myself right now. Um, but when it comes to reparations, is that the appropriate context for individuals to be promoting themselves? I don't know. So Cameron Witten seems super nice to me. Um, I think that he is like an example of someone acting in good faith when it comes to direct reparations. And I think it's important to remember that not everyone is gonna be acting in good faith. Um, just because Cameron Witten has decided to go about reparations in a non-scammy type of way does not mean that every black person will. And I think a good contrasting example is Ghazi Kodo. Um, I do not like Ghazi Kodo. I think that he is a virulent anti-Semite. Um, don't, don't even, I mean, I guess if you want to, you can look it up, but I would not advise you to look up Ghazi Koto's anti-Semitism if you want to remain not angry, um, or if you don't want to be disturbed. 
Gazi Koto was popular when I was in high school. Um, my friends and I would kind of post these videos, I think that came from Tumblr, where he would say like, Uhuru, and talk about black Jesus, and say like, you know, kind of LOL, poning white people, and it was like funny, and then his content went really off the rails in this crazy, controlling, anti-Semitic, just wild direction. Um, and Ghazi has a video where he presents his perspective on direct reparations, and I think it perfectly exemplifies why we don't want to put this tool in the hands of scammers and why it empowers people who have a desire to profiteer off of the Black Lives Matter movement. Aquaba, y'all. So I was just chilling outside by the sun because I can do that because I'm black. And then White Jesus came to me. White Jesus was like, God, I said, what White Jesus? He sounds like he's joking, but I bet he probably does think he can speak to Jesus. And he was like, you need to train male Saxons. I said, why, why, Jesus? He was like, because just like dogs, they need training. I used to think this was so funny in high school to tell the white people who bullied me that they look like mayonnaise or a toilet seat or whatever, and that they're like dogs. But it's one thing to tell somebody who you don't like, who's not your friend, that they're a dog. But if somebody is your friend, they're in your life, you have an interpersonal relationship with them, you can't treat them like a dog. I'll show you in a minute. He's going to be treating some people like dogs. I said, okay, I'll do it. So now I'm going to show you these well-trained male Saxons, toilet seat complexion individuals, okay? Disciples of white Jesus, okay? So let's talk to them real quick and let's see what they have to say. Uhuru? Uhuru. Do you owe reparations? Absolutely. Why you say that? Wait, who is you? Beryl Shepley. Uhuru, Beryl. <laughs> Now, you owe me some money. Mm -hmm. Okay, you owe me reparations. Absolutely. Why is that? Because every freedom that I have and have taken for granted for my entire life has been made possible by wealth that my ancestors stole. Uhuru. Mm -hmm. Good. Uhuru. Uhuru. What your name is? Jackson. Uhuru Jackson. You owe me reparations. I do. Why that? Because I have benefited from the wealth that was stolen from mm -hmm. you, Tell as it. have all my ancestors, um, the ones who owned slaves and the ones who did not, the Jews in uh, the white Jews in Hungary. Every you better tell on the white Jews. Say that again. The white Jews in Hungary, the fake Jews. Yes, fake white Jews. Mm -hmm. Fake white Jews. I'm convinced that the anti-Semitism of these kinds of people, like Gazi Kodo and Louis Farrakhan, and I guess now Nick Cannon as well, is rooted in some type of controlling instinct. Like they don't like that there's another group of people that's coming into the movement with their own knowledge of oppression and their own historical analysis. They wanna control everything. So they're trying to discount the relevance of anti-Semitism. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you unite with reparations. Completely. Uhuru. Uhuru. What your name is again? Jackson. Uhuru Jackson. Uhuru. So you heard it here. <laughs> if you are ready, if you are white. A lot of the white people who get involved in stuff like this, in my experience, are marginalized themselves. They are Jewish, or they're gay, or they're trans, or they're poor, or they grew up poor. They have some personal reason to sympathize with black people's struggle. And that's what I find so emotionally manipulative about this. Mayo Saxon, okay, totally sick complexion individual, salty American, and you are ready to join the revolution. Where can you go? You can go to uhurasolidarity.org and click on the red button that says pay reparations. Now. And pay those reparations when? Now. Reparations? Now. Uhuru? Uhuru. Uhuru. So as you can see, this method has a high potential for exploitation. Um, I am really, really not a fan of Gazi Kodo. I think that he is a self promoter. Um, I think that he is more about, I mean, gosh, like I just think that the way that he treats his white friends is like awful. And I don't think that Black Lives Matter is about just degrading your white friends and treating them like garbage, you know, making white people feel bad does not make our lives matter more. And I think we should have some respect for like, not to make a super corny point. It's not corny. Like I feel weird defending white allies, but like there are white people, there are black people who are dying too, but there are white people who have died in these protests. And like, it's not like, I was saying to my friend, like with black lives matter, like, yes, the greatest risk is always to black people, but I can choose like, I understand black issues in a personal way. So it's, I'm setting a boundary for myself. 
What kind of protest do I want to go to? How much risk do I want to take on? Do I want to do X, Y, Z? But when white people are involved, it's not their issue. They're not really setting their own boundary necessarily about what they are and aren't willing to do. We're kind of setting the boundary for them. So to push their boundary until they're paying us cash, I just think it's manipulative. Um, and I don't think that we should be exploiting the white people who are engaging with an issue that they don't have the ability to understand as fully as black people do. Like, I'm not saying that white people are making a bigger sacrifice, but I think they're more easily manipulated because it's not an issue they have personal knowledge of. And I think that black activists should not take advantage of the fact that white people who do Black Lives Matter work are entering this unknowable territory for them. They are not, they're just not knowledgeable about black issues in the ways that black people are. And they don't, they don't have like a, like I know how far I'm willing to go for Black Lives Matter. I know when I'm gonna say stop, I'm not doing that. I'm not sending Ghazi Kodo random money. I think it's difficult for white allies to have a sense of what is reasonable and what is not because they're getting their information from us. So we should not mislead them. I think that we need to stop telling white allies to assume good intent in every organizer because there are bad faith actors in every area of life, including the Black Lives Matter movement. We can't just feed these white allies to the scammers. It's not fair. Like, I know we're not supposed to like center white allyship or whatever, but there are white people who are going out and dying for us, who are like getting tear gassed to death. And we have to respect them enough to not just like tell them to do stuff that does not actually bolster the movement. Like, come on, we are in, I'm not saying that white allies are like more important, but they are like sort of, I hate to say it, but they're kind of more vulnerable mentally in a certain way. Like they're vulnerable to being misled. And as black people, we are the leaders and we should not lead them astray. They're allies, they're following us. And we can't just tell them to do stuff that doesn't make sense. Like, come on. One of the main problems I have with direct reparations is that it compounds the social influence that black influencers already have. Ghazi Kodo, despite being crazy, believe it or not, already had the huge following. And that is why he is able to use direct reparations to make a lot of money that other black people will never see or have any kind of access to. Um, and I don't understand, like reparations is supposed to go to everyone equally. In this crazy direct reparations world, the people who get the most reparations are the people who need it the least the black people who already have influence with white people, who already have a bunch of white friends to pay them the reparations, and black people who live in predominantly black communities who are not around a bunch of white people are not gonna have a bunch of liberal arts white friends to pay them cash for their white guilt. Like, that's just not realistic. The main arguments I hear in favor of direct reparations are that it is quicker and that it is more direct or involves more accountability somehow. Um, it is quicker. So this to me maybe is the more compelling argument that because the government has dragged its feet on reparations, um, that individuals should pick up the slack and speed up the process. Um, and then some people would add, oh, poor people cannot wait for the government to do reparations. And you know, reparations is not really supposed to be about need or poverty, although it's connected. It's supposed to be about a debt that is owed. Society, the US, the US government owes money to black people for slavery, regardless of the level of need. Um, I think if people are in need, they should use GoFundMe. You know, if you're in need, you should ask for money, describe why you need that money so that people know where the money is going and that that is a much more transparent process. Um, I know it's hard for people to ask for money when they're in need, but if you don't ask for the specific thing that you need, then people don't know where their money is going to. And that is weird to me. And again, kind of feeds into the corrupt dynamic of direct reparations. The second argument is that it's more accountable or direct. I mean, I guess it is more direct to do direct reparations. I'm calling it direct reparations. So yeah, it is kind of more direct. I don't know that it's necessarily more accountable. I experience it as a way for white allies to get out of engaging genuinely with racial topics um, and to say, oh, I paid this amount. My job is done. I don't have to feel guilty anymore. 
Um, and to me, that's like the opposite of accountability. I don't think that paying your black friend 10 to $20 necessarily makes you a better ally to your friend. I think that it's important to be anti-racist in your day-to-day -day life, to support anti-racist causes, to support organizations that serve the black community in an equitable way, rather than just paying your favorite black friend a certain amount of money. Um, I don't really know how people even decide like, I guess these people only have one black friend because if you had more than one, then you'd be out $40. If you have three, then you're out $60. Like, I just think it's weird. You can't buy forgiveness for racism. There's no amount of money. You have to be anti-racist in your life. Personally, I'm not gonna feel better about a white person and their degree of anti-racism just because they sent me cash over Venmo. That's so weird. It shows they don't see me as a peer. It shows that they want to like, they're acting like my, I'm like my white friends are not my employer. I just really feel that you cannot buy your way out of white guilt. You cannot buy forgiveness for racism. I don't want to receive $20 from a random white person because it implies that that white person's work is done and being anti-racist is a process. And I guess you could describe direct reparations as a process as well, but I really just think that it skirts accountability. It doesn't involve any critical thinking. And ultimately, like, it doesn't go to the community. It goes to a black person who, honestly, it seems like these white people are buying affection from their black friends and from black influencers. And that has nothing to do with the movement. The bottom line to me, I feel, is that we need systemic solutions to systemic issues. And direct reparations is, by definition, individual. It is not systemic. It is not distributed equally throughout members of the black community. It is only distributed to black individuals in a definitionally not equitable way. And that is the problem to me, is that the whole community is not getting the same amount. And if you're an influencer, you're getting more, and that's just not fair. Even if you are a proponent of direct reparations, you have to admit there is no way to control whether some black people get more money than other black people. And I think that reveals the fundamental corruption of this idea of direct reparations. To me, direct reparations comes off as a quick fix for interpersonal guilt that you have towards your black friends or for feelings of discomfort around Black Lives Matter and a desire to, you know, ameliorate that discomfort in a kind of fast way by just making a payment rather than working through it and thinking about why you feel that way. Um, you know, if you want to support Black Lives Matter in a monetary capacity, there are lots of organizations that you can support that will distribute funds in a more equitable fashion to Black people. And you know, I think that individual support for racial justice should be social. You should make a personal commitment to be anti-racist in your life, to have anti-racist political views, and to learn about anti-racism rather than just shutting your brain off and making a payment. I don't think that that is helpful. I think that white people who support this direct reparations idea, you know, I used to be more involved in direct action organizing. And when white people pay money to these kinds of scammers, it empowers them and it makes them more influential in activist circles to the point that activist circles are dominated by the kinds of people who are willing to accept cash payments from white people who feel guilty. Um, I really hated that dynamic. I felt that a lot of people um, lacked integrity and did not have a desire to serve the entire black community in an equitable way. I felt that many of the people I was around were career activists who wanted to profiteer off of the clout they had gotten from being involved in Black Lives Matter. Um, and that's not like a diss to Black Lives Matter. I think that there are scammers and self-promoters in every area of life, but that for some reason we give Black Lives Matter, we see it as so moral that maybe we don't look for people who behave that way. And there's people like that everywhere. So consider when you empower a black person, I think that white people, it's like kind of a, it's kind of a weird way of not telling black people apart. Like be specific about what kind of black activist you want to support. Do you want to support someone who is asking people to pay them cash for speaking? How do you think that makes other black people who are trying to organize feel? Consider the interpersonal relationships between black people, not just your relationship to individual black people, but consider people in a community context. I called it scammer world. 
it was so frustrating to do Black Lives Matter organizing because so many people had chosen to profiteer. And some of those people, honestly, were people who were not acting in bad faith, who were broke, who actually needed money. And it's really complicated because a lot of black people, um, you know, really need the reparations that they're getting from direct reparations. Um, and that makes sense to me. But ultimately, like, it just creates this financial popularity contest between organizers, in my experience, and it's incredibly weird. So that's all I have to say about reparations. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe down below if you want to see more. Hit the bell to get notified. Um, I'm probably going to be back to talk about Sean King, uh, one of my other least favorite scammers, um, in addition to Gazi Koto. So wait for that. Wait for some. I'll probably do some more lighthearted pop culture commentary as well. There's a lot of celebrities I like. Um, so thanks for watching. Bye.